Lecture number three, The True Nature of Existence. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. One time the Buddha addressed his disciples. He said, monks, it may be that ascetics belonging to other sects will ask you, what is the purpose of leading the spiritual life under the Buddha. If they asked you this question, what would you answer? The monks remained silent. Then the Buddha said, if they should ask you, what is the purpose of leading the spiritual life, the brahmacharya, under the Buddha, you should answer them. It is for the purpose of understanding things that should be fully understood that we lead the spiritual life under the Buddha. Then the Buddha said, And what are the things that should be fully understood? They are the five aggregates of clinging. Material form, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. These are the things that should be fully understood. It is for the full understanding of these things that we lead the spiritual life under the Buddha. From this incident, we can see that the path laid down by the Buddha is essentially a path of understanding. The understanding aimed at is not merely conceptual knowledge, accumulating information, bits and pieces of knowledge. Rather, it is insight, direct and immediate insight into the true nature of our existence. This understanding brings liberation the release of the mind from all the bonds and fetters that hold it in bondage, and it issues in the end of suffering, the cessation of dukkha. In this statement, the Buddha also indicates what has to be fully understood, what has to be known. What we have to understand is the nature of our own existence, our own experience. That is, we have to understand the five aggregates, the basic components of our being. Our own experience is, of all things, that which lies closest to ourselves. Since it is through our own experience that we contact everything else. However, ordinarily, we do not understand our own experience. We don't even make the effort to understand it. We use our experience to contact other things, to know and enjoy the world of the six senses, the world of sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, sensations, and ideas. But the experiencing itself doesn't get examined. Thus, we continue to learn about everything except the instrument of knowledge. Yet it is just this experience of understanding that provides the key to wisdom. The method of the Buddha reverses this procedure. The Buddha offers us the Dhamma as a searchlight we can focus on our own experience in order to understand it in correct perspective, yatha Buddha. To understand our experience, our existence, involves two steps. First, we have to look into the makeup of a being to see what our existence consists of, to take it apart mentally, to see how it works, then to put it together again and see how it holds together. The second step is to examine our experience in order to discover its most pervasive features, the universal characteristics of phenomena. We'll take these two steps in turn. The first step requires that we treat our experience analytically. We have to dissect the person, the being, our own individuality. We have to dissect it into its factors. The Buddha reveals that what we are, our being, our personality, is a composite 
of five groups of factors which are called the five aggregates of clinging. In Pali, the Panchupadana Kanda. These are called aggregates of clinging because they form the basis for clinging. Whatever we cling to can be found among the five aggregates, either material form, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, or consciousness. These five function together as the instrument for our experience of the world. We cling to them as the instrument of experience in this life. And when they break down at death through that same clinging, the desire for enjoyment and for existence, we bring into being a new set of aggregates, a new life to continue our experience in another existence. Thus we build up one set of aggregates after another, life after life, and in that way we accumulate dukkha, the suffering of the round of samsara. The Buddha says that the five aggregates are to be fully understood. That is the truth of dukkha, the first noble truth. And the first noble truth, the function with regard to that truth, is to fully understand it. To bring suffering to an end, to win the freedom, the peace, the happiness of deliverance, we have to turn our attention around and see into the nature of the five aggregates. The five aggregates are our burden, but at the same time they provide us with the indispensable soil of wisdom. In the last talk, we explain the five aggregates in a general way. This time we are going to examine them in greater detail. Our treatment will be largely analytical, but throughout it should be remembered that Buddhism pursues analysis, not for its own sake, not in order to accumulate data and information, but rather to lay bare the nature of our existence as a preliminary to direct insight. The term aggregate in Pali Kanda means a collection, a heap of factors. Each of the five aggregates is called a Kanda because each includes under itself many factors. A Kanda is a category or a classification containing a whole set of phenomena that share a common characteristic. Between them, the five aggregates exhaust our psychophysical existence. Any event, any occurrence, any element in the mind-body process can be put into one of the five aggregates. There is nothing in the whole experiential process that lies outside the five aggregates. The first aggregate is the aggregate of material form, the Rupa Kanda. This aggregate includes all the material factors of existence, every type of material phenomena. Most important, of course, is the body, the physical organism through which we experience the world. The Buddha analyzes the aggregate of material form into two basic subsets. First, there is the four primary elements. Then second, there are the secondary forms of matter. The four primary elements are called by the old mythological names. The earth element, the water element, the heat element, and the air element. But for Buddhism, these terms do not mean literally the natural earth, the water, the fire, and air. Rather, they symbolize four behavioral properties of matter, properties common to all material phenomena, properties that every material body exhibits. The earth element is the property of extension. 
the property by which a material body occupies space has some degree of hardness or softness, resists pressure, and excludes other bodies from occupying the same space. The water element represents the property of cohesion. Because of this water element, material particles bind together and adhere to one another. The heat element is straightforward. This is the principle of heat by which all phenomena, all material phenomena, possess some degree of heat. Even when a particular substance feels cold to us, that is only because it contains less heat than our own body. But every material body possesses some degree of heat, some amount of the heat element. Then the air element is the principle of oscillation by reason of which all material particles are in a state of vibration. By reason of this, material bodies can exhibit motion. Now, all material phenomena, as we said, possess these four elements to some degree. What distinguishes them is the proportion in which the primary elements are combined. We discriminate the types of matter on the basis of the dominant element. Thus we get solid bodies, liquids, gases, and forms of energy, depending on the proportions or the predominance of earth, water, heat, and air. But the four elements are present to some degree in every unit of matter. Besides the four primary elements, there are a number of secondary types of matter, material forms which are derived from the primary. These are called upada rupa, upadaya rupa, derivative matter. The most important of these are the five sensory receptors, that is, the sensitive tissue of the five sense faculties, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body. The sensitive matter by reason of which the eye can receive light, the ear can receive sound, the nose smell, the tongue can receive taste, and the body can receive touch sensation. The first four sense data, that is, colors, sounds, smells, and tastes, those are also types of secondary matter. The touch sensations, those are provided by material form itself, by the primary elements themselves. Other types of secondary material form are the life faculty, the faculty which vitalizes the body and keeps it alive. Also included is the mental base, that is, the organs and nerve tissue which function as the supports for consciousness with its thought processes. Now, this one aggregate of material form comprises the entire material side of existence. The, the mental side is distributed among the other four aggregates. The mind for Buddhism is not a simple unity, but a complex cooperative activity involving four types of factors, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. First, we take the aggregate of feelings, the Vedanakanda, the second of the five aggregates. Now, feeling is the mental factor that has the function of experiencing the flavor of the object, the affective quality of the object. There are three basic types of feeling. Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neutral feeling. Feeling can further be subdivided by way of the sense faculty through which it originates. So that we get feeling which arises by contact through the eye, 
to the ear, through the nose, through the tongue, through the body, then also feeling which arises inwardly by contact of the mind with ideas and with images. That is the aggregate of feeling. The third aggregate is the aggregate of perception, the sanyakanda. Perception is the mental act of grasping the distinguishing qualities of the object. Perception takes note of the object's features. It identifies, marks, notices. Perceptions occurring through the eye take note of color and shape. They make the mental note, that's blue, that's red, that's square, that's round. Perception occurring through the ear makes note of sound a loud sound, a soft sound, high, low. Perception also notices and identifies objects and people. That's a book. That's a lamp. That's Jim. That's Sally. He has brown hair. He's tall, and so on. This is all the work of perception. And perception is divided into six categories by way of the sense object that it arises through, by way of the sense object that it takes note of, that is, perception of forms, perception of sounds, perception of smells, perception of taste, perception of tangibles, and then perception of ideas. The fourth aggregate is the aggregate of mental formations, the Sankara Kanda. Mental formation, Sankara, this is a comprehensive group which includes a number of factors. In the Abhidhamma, 50 Sankaras are distinguished. But of these, the most important is volition or will, that is called Chaitana. This is the factor responsible for action the mental factor which arouses us to act by way of body or speech, or the factor which impels and motivates thought. The aggregate of mental formations also includes all the different desires and emotions. And of special importance, it includes the factors called the wholesome and unwholesome roots. That is, the basic psychological roots of unwholesome actions, greed, hatred, and delusion, and the basic roots of wholesome actions, that is, generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. The fifth aggregate is the aggregate of consciousness, the vijnana khanda. Consciousness is the chief factor of mind. That is, it's the basic awareness of the object, the light of awareness, which makes all experience possible. And consciousness is divided into six types by way of its basis. There is eye consciousness or visual consciousness. That is, the consciousness which arises through the eye, cognizing visible forms. Then there is ear consciousness or hearing consciousness, which cognizes sound. There's nose consciousness, which cognizes smells. Tongue consciousness, which cognizes taste. Body consciousness, which cognizes tangibles, touch sensations. And then there's mind consciousness or thought, con thought consciousness. And this type of consciousness, mind consciousness, can cognize the objects of the senses, that is, sight, sound, smells, taste, and touch sensations. And it also can deal with its own class of objects, ideas, concepts, images, abstract notions, and so on. Consciousness seems similar to perception, resembles it in certain ways, but the two perform different functions. Consciousness is the general awareness of the object, 
and perception is the specific factor which grasps the object's distinctive qualities. But all the four mental aggregates always exist together. They all depend upon one another. They are always invariably associated with each other. So whenever there is any experience of an object, at that moment there is present simultaneously a feeling, a perception, a whole cluster of mental formation, and then, of course, there is the fifth aggregate, consciousness, the light of awareness. So these are the five aggregates. And these five aggregates constitute what is called sakaya, literally the existing body, the psychophysical organism, our personality, our individuality. Whatever we identify ourselves with, whatever we take to be I, myself, can be found within the five aggregates. Therefore, if we are to understand ourselves, what we have to understand are the five aggregates. Now, to fully understand the five aggregates means to see them as they really are. And this means to see them in terms of the three characteristics of existence. These three characteristics are first, impermanence, anicita, second, unsatisfactoriness or suffering, dukkata, and thirdly, selflessness, non-self, insubstantiality, anatta. The Buddha says, habe sankara anicca, all formations are impermanent, sabe sankara dukkha, all formations are unsatisfactory and sabe dhamma anatta. All phenomena, totally everything whatsoever, is not self. All formations, sankaras, formations, are things which arise through causes and conditions. And everything that arises through causes and conditions all compounded or formed phenomena are impermanent and unsatisfactory. Then all phenomena, all dhammas, all actualities are not self, egoless, without substance. Now normally we do not recognize the three characteristics. We do not see them, even though we might have experiences which disclose them, we don't see them in their full depth, in their full significance. And the reason why these three characteristics are so difficult to see is because the mind is ordinarily covered over by a bija, that is, by ignorance. Ignorance is a specific mental factor which covers over our minds, which has been covering over the minds of all sentient beings through beginningless time. It covers the minds of everyone but the fully enlightened ones, the Buddhas and the Arahants. Now, ignorance functions in two ways, one negative, the other positive. On the negative side, ignorance simply obstructs us from seeing things as they are. It throws up clouds of mental darkness. It conceals the true nature of phenomena so that we ignore the real marks of things. But ignorance also has another function, a positive function. That is, it creates in the mind certain appearances, illusions, which are called in Pali vipalasas, literally perversion. These perversions infest the entire process of consciousness. 
so that instead of seeing things as they really are, we see them in ways which are quite the opposite of the way they really are. That is why they're called perversion. They turn everything we become aware of upside down. The perversions operate at three levels the level of perception, the level of thought, and the level of understanding. First of all, we perceive things in a, in a distorted way. Then building upon these distorted perceptions, the mind thinks about the percepts in a distorted way. Then weaving these distorted thoughts together into a picture of the world we interpret our experience in a distorted way. That is, we become subject to the perversion of you, to wrong understanding. Now, the Buddha teaches that these four perversions, or we should say, the Buddha mentions four perversions which occur at each of these three levels. The first is the perversion of regarding the unattractive as attractive. This refers especially to objects of sense enjoyment. Seeing the body as beautiful and attractive when the body is really a mass of skin, bones, organs, flesh, and blood. The second perversion is the perversion of regarding what is really dukkha as a source of true happiness seeing what is unsatisfactory, insecure, connected with pain, seeing that as pleasurable. The third is the perversion of regarding the impermanent as permanent. And the fourth is the perversion of regarding what is really not self, not an ego, taking that to be our self, our ego. Each of these four perversions occurs at the three levels, perception, thinking, and view. And because of these distorted motions, our minds get caught up in the web of illusion. They give rise to craving, conceit, wrong views, and all the other defilements. And in that way, we become lost in dukkha, in suffering. The Buddha's teaching on the three universal marks of existence, impermanence, suffering, and selflessness, this gives us the remedy to clear away these delusions, the means to get free from suffering. The perversion of regarding the unattractive as attractive, this is limited to the body, and therefore its antidote, which is the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body, this is not really a universal characteristic, but is more limited in scope. The three universal characteristics are impermanent, suffering or unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. And these three characteristics have to be understood in two stages. First, they have to be understood intellectually by reflection, by examination. Then when we've understood them intellectually, then we have to penetrate them by direct experience, through direct insight. Now, intellectual understanding should not be confused with insight, and it shouldn't be made a substitute for it. The value of intellectual understanding is preliminary. It serves as a preparation for insight. But eventually, it has to give way to direct realization. And so when we explain these characteristics intellectually, we shouldn't make this a substitute for practice, but just use it as a guideline for understanding what has to be seen through the actual practice of insight meditation. Now we'll take these three characteristics in turn. The first characteristic is anicitta, impermanence. This is the root characteristic in the Buddha's teaching. 
the characteristic which is the most fundamental, the one which forms a basis for the other two, because of the characteristic of impermanence, as we'll see, that things become unsatisfactory and become egoless. The mark of impermanence has two aspects. One is growth, the other is subtle. The growth mark of impermanence is fairly evident, and we only have to attend to it in order for it to become clear. The teaching on gross impermanence makes it known that everything that arises must at some time pass away, that whatever comes into being must eventually pass out of being, that whatever is put together sometime comes apart. This is evident in the cosmic process, in the course of history, and in the course of our own life. The Buddha teaches that the cosmic process goes through four stages of development. Every world system goes through four stages. First, it emerges from a state of undifferentiated matter. Then it evolves to a point of maximum differentiation. Then thirdly, it begins to disintegrate. And fourthly, it goes to a stage of total disintegration, total destruction. Then, after some time, the process repeats itself over and over. In that way, every world system arises, evolves, and passes away. In history, we find the same pattern again. A civilization, an empire, arises, reaches its zenith, then it declines, and eventually it perishes. In some suttas, the Buddha sometimes describes ancient empires of the distant past, even long before his own time. He describes their capital cities, their rulers, their courts, their ministers, their populations. He shows them in all their glory, and then he points out that all of this has passed away. Then he draws the inevitable conclusion that all formations are impermanent, unstable, comfortless. It's enough to turn away from them, to become detached from them, enough to get free from them. In our own life also, we can see the mark of impermanence. We are born and grow up, and when growth reaches its maximum, it's followed by aging, decay, and death. And nothing in life is absolutely reliable. Our fortunes change, our interests, our characters, our relationships evolve and dissolve. Whatever built up comes apart. Whatever we gain eventually has to be lost, and the whole process of life eventually ends in death. That is the gross or coarse feature of impermanence. The subtle mark of impermanence is more difficult to grasp. This indicates not merely that everything produced eventually perishes, but that all being itself is really a process of becoming. It points out that there are no static entities persisting unchanged, but only dynamic processes which appear to us to be stable and static simply because our perception is not sharp enough to detect the changes. The things themselves are constantly undergoing change, just as a waterfall is always changing, but from a distance it seems solid because our perception can pick up the flow of water. According to the Buddha, all formations, all momentary happening thing events go through three stages. They have three sub-moments. There is a moment of arising, finally a moment of perishing, and between the two 
there is a moment called Pitasa Anyatatta. That is the transformation of that which endures. And this intermediate mark, this means that even in the brief moment when a thing exists, it isn't static but changing, a process, a flux of becoming. The stable entities that we see, conceive, and deal with, these are really bundles of events, packages or of momentary flashing, strung together by our perception into a mass in order to enable us to deal with the world, to get along in the world. Now, the Buddha's teaching on radical impermanence applies to all conditional things, all formations without exception, but it applies especially to our own personality, to the complex of the five aggregates. To the eye of insight, I am our entire being dissolves into a compound of conditioned factors subject to constant change, to change and transformation going on continuously without a break. First take the aggregate of material form. The body is made up of minute groups of material phenomena, which are themselves actually Dreams of events arising and passing away with incredible speed of transformation. The change take place, takes place so rapidly that the eye and mind cannot register it. If we twirl a glowing stick in the dark, the eyes fuse the moving point of light into a, the shape of a circle. So there are appears to be a solid circle of light. In the same way, material form is subject to a continual flux of becoming, arising and passing away thousands of times each second. But all these processes get fused together into the appearance of a solid body. But the stable, solid material body that is actually a mental representation, not a reality. It is a mental image arising in the mind and superimposed on the streams of material events, giving rise to the perception of a stable material object. But through keen mindfulness and insight, the stable body dissolves reveals itself to be just a collection of minute material processes arising and perishing from moment to moment. The same process of change applies to the mind. The mind is a composite of the four mental aggregates, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. And these are all in process. Streams of events arising and perishing countless times each second. Every moment there is a new feeling arising and passing away. A new perception, new mental formations, a new consciousness. They seem to form a stable, lasting mind, but this is only an appearance caused by the continuity of the process. Actually, there is a succession of frames of mind, discrete acts of cognition, made up of the four mental aggregates. The processes exhibit the same structures, similar patterns, so there appears to be the lasting mind. But beneath the outer cover-up pattern, the factors themselves are always changing, arising and dissolving. If we pay careful attention to the mental process, we see the rise and fall of mental events. Attention to the rise and fall breaks up the appearance of continuity, reveals the differences between events. 
and the discrete nature of the mental factors. And that way we get to discover the subtle mark of impermanence, of anicitta. The second characteristic of existence is dukkata. Last, in our last talk, we explained that dukkha means both felt pain and suffering and also the general unsatisfactoriness of conditioned existence. And here the general characteristic of unsatisfactoriness is intended as the meaning of dukkata. But the two are in totally separate. A fundamental reason why existence is unsatisfactory is because it is connected with pain, subject to suffering. The pain and suffering to a great extent are rooted in impermanence. We crave for a world where everything that we value and love will remain forever, but it has to change. And when we meet this change, then we undergo suffering. The five aggregates themselves are impermanent. We would like to preserve them, to make them steady, to dominate them with our will, but they escape our grasp, and then we meet with dissatisfaction, with suffering. Our inability to control the very things that we take to be ourselves. The Visuddhi Magga, the great commentary, says that dukkha has the meaning of a Oppression by rise and fall. Rise and fall is the feature of impermanence. The five aggregates are subject to constant rise and fall. And when we contrast this rise and fall with our desire for peace, for stability, then the rise and fall of the process seems oppressive. Therefore, oppressiveness by rise and fall is the distinguishing feature of dukkha. Since we discussed the characteristic of dukkha in full detail last in the last talk, we'll just treat it very briefly here. Now the third characteristic of existence is anatta, selflessness, the non-self. And this is the deepest, most difficult of the three characteristics. So we'll give it more attention than the others. Now in the teaching on anatta, the Buddha proclaims that there is nothing that we can identify as self, that all the things that we take to be ourself, to be I and mine, that all of these are really not self. This teaching on anatta cuts very sharply against our ingrained patterns of thinking. Almost all of our thoughts, all our activities, all our concerns center around the ideas of I, mine, myself. Yet the Buddha holds that these notions are deceptive, delusions that lead us into trouble, conflict, and suffering. And he teaches further that in order to get free from dukkha in all of its forms, we have to break out of the clinging to the idea of self. And the only way to do that is to penetrate the mark of selflessness, anatta, to see with insight the selfless nature of all phenomena. The teaching on anatta can easily be misunderstood. To see the exact meaning of the teaching, we have to discriminate between what the teaching denies and what it doesn't deny. We can approach this discrimination by distinguishing the different meanings of the word self. The word anatta means literally not self. So what is the self that's denied in the teaching of anatta? The word self can be used in three senses. Firstly, it can be used with a reflexive meaning, as when we speak of myself, yourself, oneself. And the Buddha accepts this use of the word self. He says you have to train yourself, one must purify oneself, you have to make the effort yourself, and so on. That's a perfectly legitimate use of the word self. 
The second use is to refer to one's own person, to refer to the compound of body and mind. Here the word self or I is a shorthand device. It's used to refer easily and economically to what is really a complex process. In this sense that the word self is also acceptable in Buddhism. We use it to distinguish different people. The third sense of self is that of a substantial ego entity, a lasting subject existing at the core of a complex process. In this sense that the word self is also acceptable in Buddhism. We use it to distinguish different people. The third sense of self is that of a substantial ego entity, a lasting subject existing at the core of the psychophysical personality. And it is with the idea of selfhood in this sense that the Buddha's teaching is concerned. The reason is that it is this assumption of an ego self that gets us trapped in suffering. And now the teaching on Anatta doesn't deny the existence of the person, the individual, taken as the psychophysical complex. What it denies is that the person exists as a self, as a lasting, simple ego entity. The person exists, but the person is Anatta, not self not ego. The person or the individual is a complex of the five aggregates. And to say that the person exists is to say that this unified composite of the five aggregates exists. To say that the person is anatta without self, without ego, is to say that the five aggregates cannot be identified as a self and do not contain a self, that no inner nucleus of selfhood can be found within or behind the personality made up of the five aggregates. The teaching of Anatta is the most radical doctrine of the Buddha, the doctrine which cuts across all our habits of thinking and conceiving. For we usually see ourselves to be a self. We identify the body and mind as a self, or believe that we have a self standing behind them in some mysterious way. This is taken to be so obvious as to be beyond dispute. Yet the Buddha holds that the seeming presence of a self is an illusion, a mirage. When we look carefully, we find not a self, but only five aggregates, which are insubstantial without a self. Perhaps we can make the point clearer with an example. Suppose we're walking down a country road at night. We look down on the ground and suddenly we see a snake. We become frightened. Then we turn our flashlights on it, we look again, and we see there's only a rope, no snake. So we say that there is no snake there, there is only a rope that appeared as a snake. The rope was there all along, never a snake, but the rope appeared to us to be a snake. It appeared as a snake because our sight was obscured by the darkness, because we didn't focus our light on it. As a result of seeing the snake, we became filled with fear and worry. We found out it was only a rope appearance of the snake dissolved, we saw the rope, and then our fears dissolved. We became very happy and joyful. We felt relief. Now we can compare the rope to the personality, the complex of the five aggregates. We can compare the snake to the idea of a self or ego. Because of our ignorance, we don't see the five aggregates as they are, as simply five aggregates but we see them as a self, as a substantial ego. And as long as we lack direct insight, wisdom, we go on taking the aggregates to be self 
and we evaluate all our experience from that perspective, from the standpoint of ego clinging. But when we develop wisdom, we can apply that wisdom to our personality, the way we apply the flashlight to the rope. And then we see the person as being just the complex of the aggregate, without being the self, without containing the self. To make the teaching of Anatta clearer, we have to investigate two things more carefully. First, what exactly is the nature of selfhood? What does the notion of being the self involve? And secondly, why is the person not a self? What are the reasons for negating selfhood in the five aggregates? We'll take each question in turn. First, we want to see what the idea of self involves. If we examine our ingrained notion of selfhood, what we unconsciously assume when we take ourselves to be a self, I think we'll find that it involves four ideas. These might be called the criteria of selfhood. There might be other ideas lying implicit, but um, these seem to be the four ideas that are dominant, at least that I've discovered. First, there's the idea of duration or lastingness. We think that the self has to be some kind of entity which endures, which persists through time. It might be a temporary kind of duration. If we hold, for example, that our self came into existence at birth, continues as the same self throughout life, and then is finally annihilated at death. Or else it might be a permanent type of duration. When we think of the self as something that comes into being perhaps at birth, maybe even exists before birth, it continues as the same self throughout life, and then it survives forever into the future. That is, we have the idea of a permanent, everlasting, and eternal self. So this is first the notion of duration or lasting. The second idea involved in the notion of selfhood is that of simplicity. By this we mean that the self is conceived to be a, an incomposite entity, something which is not compounded, not analyzable into parts, something that possesses a basic simplicity or indivisibility. The third idea implicit in the notion of selfhood is being unconditioned. We think that the self must possess own power of being. It must be self-sufficient, unconditioned, not dependent entirely upon causes and conditions. If something exists through conditions, if it is entirely dependent on conditions, then we can't identify with it. It doesn't seem to be us, but to belong to the conditions which sustain it. So the self is conceived of as being a self-sufficient or unconditioned entity. Then the fourth idea involved in the notion of selfhood is that of being susceptible to our control. In Pali, this is vastabhattita, being susceptible to control. What this means is this. If something really belongs to us in our essence, if we consist in this, then if it can be identified as ourself, then we should be able to exercise mastery over it, to control it, so that wherever we determine it should be, it would follow our determination. There would never be any conflict between what we want our self to be and what it becomes. The thing that's taken to belong to us, to be ourself, would always conform to our notion of what it should be. We'd be able to control it, to exercise mastery over it. So these are the four basic notions that enter into the concept of a self. The notions of permanence, 
of simplicity, of unconditionedness, and of being susceptible to our control. And now we should examine our personalities, the five aggregates, in the light of these ideas. Ordinarily, we don't do this. We simply assume that we have a self. We don't bother to investigate the idea of self close up. We don't try to give the idea any substance. And thus, the idea of self remains as a kind of specter, a phantom lurking behind our experience and our actions, something very vague and undefined. But for a thinker, for one seeking truth, this ambiguous view of self isn't sufficient. If there is a self, we have to try to pin it down, to define it, to find what it is. And when we try to conceive a self, to give it some content, it has to be conceived in relation to what is directly experienced, that is, the body and mind, the five aggregates. If the idea of self is to have any meaning, any content, it has to be set in relation to the body, the feelings, the perceptions, the formations of mind and consciousness. Without positing any relation between the two, then it becomes just a word, a completely empty notion. Now when we try to posit the self in relation to the five aggregates, a number of relations are possible, but these can all be reduced to two, either identity or difference. That is, when we conceive ourselves to be a self, we must do so either by identifying the self with some aspect of the body-mind complex, or else by distinguishing the self from the body-mind complex. In the second case, the self is seen as distinct from the five aggregates of body and mind, either inside the body and mind, behind them, or their invisible owner. Now let's examine each of these two positions in turn, starting with the first one, the position which asserts identity between the self and the aggregate, which regards the aggregate as the self. Then we'll deal later with the other position. Now, we can show that the aggregates are not self by viewing them in the light of the four ideas we just laid down as implied by the concept of self. Permanence, simplicity, unconditionedness, and being subject to control. First, the self is taken to be a lasting, enduring entity. But the five aggregates, as we saw, are all impermanent. The bodily form is a mass of vibrations, a current of material groups always arising and passing away. The mind also is a series of momentary occasions of, of awareness, feeling, perceiving, willing, and being conscious, also constantly arising and passing away. And there's no one behind the mental process watching it a subject, an observer. There are just these momentary mental acts, the thoughts themselves of the thinker. Usually we incline to identify the mind as self rather than the body, since the mind is conscious, and we think of the self as conscious. But the Buddha says that it's better to consider the body as self rather than the mind. The body at least has some apparent stability, it lasts at least to our awareness for some time. But when we examine the mental process, we see its factors changing even faster than the body. And since the five aggregates are impermanent, subject to rise and fall, they cannot be identified as self. Otherwise, it fo would follow that the self is arising and passing away. And so our self would become a succession of different selves, hardly the same continuous self that we take ourselves to be. The second aspect of the self-concept is simplicity, indivisibility. But when we examine the individual person, we find a complex whole, a compound of the five aggregates. We find a body, 
feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. We don't find anything behind them, anything else. Each aggregate, each of the five aggregates, covers a multiplicity of elements. Usually, under the spell of ignorance, we grasp our experience as a whole. We grasp it as a single mass. And thus it appears to have some kind of solidity, to be a monolithic whole. But when we subject it to precise analysis, we find that the seemingly unified mass breaks down into a multitude of constituent parts. Every experience is just a complex or composite of the five aggregates. So what should we identify with self? The body? The body is a mass of cells, tissues, organs, skin, bones, and so on. So which of these is the self? Feeling? But feeling is of different kinds. Pleasant, painful, neutral. Feeling arising through eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind. Perceptions are different. The mental formations are different. Consciousness is always different. So which of these is to be identified as self? Whatever we choose turns out to be impermanent. So it can't be taken to be self. The third aspect of the self concept is the notion of being unconditioned, self-subsistent. But when we examine the five aggregates, we find that they are all conditioned phenomena. They arise through conditions. They don't exist by themselves. The body with its sense faculties arises from the sperm and the egg. It arises from father and mother. It gains its being from the bodies of the parents. And the father and mother also, they gain their being from their parents, and so on, back to infinity. So no body exists through itself. Then the body continues to exist through food. It's a flowing metamorphosis of rice, potatoes, vegetables, meat, fruits, sweets, and so on, coming in at one end, flowing out through the other. It's supported by air, water, and sunshine. Then the mental side, the mental process is conditioned by the body. Consciousness doesn't exist by itself, but it exists as a series of states of consciousness. And each of these moments of consciousness arises with some material support, supported by the physical organism. Visual consciousness arises dependent on the eye and on visible forms. Hearing consciousness depends on the ear and on sound. Touch consciousness or body consciousness depends on the physical body and tangible objects. Even thought consciousness arises depending upon the organ of thinking, the brain, and upon the nervous tissue. Feelings, perceptions, volitions, all these too are conditioned. None of them has an independent existence. So no aspect of the five aggregates is unconditioned. Then the fourth aspect of the self-concept is being susceptible control to the exercise of mastery. If something is truly our essence, truly our self, we must be able to bring it under our domination, to exercise mastery over it. But we find the five aggregates can be subjected to our volitional control can command them or bend them to our will, since they depend on outer causes and conditions which are external to ourselves beyond our control. And therefore, since they depend upon outer conditions, we can't master them. This is the Buddha's argument in the first discourse, in the second discourse that he gave, right after the teaching on the Four Noble Truths. He said to the monks, if the five aggregates were self, they wouldn't lead to affliction, they wouldn't lead to suffering. And we would be able to control them. So we could say, may my body and mind be thus, may they not be thus, may they be the way I want them to be, may they not go contrary to my desires. But we can control the five aggregates in this way, the five aggregates lead to affliction, they lead to suffering, therefore the five aggregates are not self. If the body was truly ours, 
we'd be able to say, may my body always be young, healthy, beautiful, and immortal. May it not become old, may it not become sick, may it not be ugly, may it not die. If the feelings were ours, we could say, may my feelings always be pleasant, never painful. May my perceptions always be agreeable, never disagreeable. May my volitions always be good and wholesome, never defiled and unwholesome. May my consciousness always be right, be bright and radiant, filled with knowledge and awareness. May it never be dull, defiled, sad, so on. Since we want only happiness and never suffering, if the five aggregates were self, they would always produce happiness for us and never lead to suffering. But again and again, they lead to suffering. We don't have control over them. Therefore, the five aggregates are not self. And that deals with the first position. The aggregates cannot be identified as a self because the self must be lasting, simple, unconditioned, and subject to mastery, whereas the five aggregates are impermanent, compounded, conditioned, and not subject to mastery. Now we take the second position. This position holds that there is a self distinct from the aggregate, contained within them or behind them. But if there does exist a self distinct from the aggregates, we should be able to find it, to point to it, to say, this is myself. But when we try to identify the self, to give the idea some content. Whatever we come upon, whatever we grasp hold of, turns out to be one or another of the five aggregates or some combination of them. Even the mind which is doing the searching, that is just a group of aggregates. A mind consciousness associated with feelings, perceptions, and volitions. We can't find any self separate and distinct from the aggregate. This is like looking for a pit inside an onion. We open the onion and start looking for the pit. All we find is roll after roll of onion without any core or pit on the inside. So looking for the self within the compound of mind and body, all we find are aggregates and closing aggregates and closing aggregates. We never hit upon any solid, substantial self. The notion of self turns out to be a void idea, an idea without content. But some people try to interpret Nibbana as a self. They take Nibbana, Nirvana, to be a supreme universal self. But this idea is not acceptable according to the early form of the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha says, Sabe Dhamma Anatta. All Dhammas, all actualities are not self. He says, All formations are impermanent and all formations are unsatisfactory. But all Dhammas are not self. All formations covers only conditioned things, Sankaras. Nibbana, the unconditioned, is not a Sankara. Therefore, it's not impermanent and not suffering. On the contrary, it's lasting and stable and the supreme happiness. But Nibbana is a Dhamma, and because it's a Dhamma in actuality, it can't be identified as a universal or supreme self. To illustrate the selfless nature of the five aggregates, the Buddha gives certain similes. He says that the body is like a lump of foam. A lump of foam seems solid, but when we crush it, it turns out to be just hollow and empty. Feeling is like bubbles, bubbles on water. They just arise and break up and show themselves to be empty. Perception is like a mirage. Mirage appears, but when we examine the object, we don't find anything substantial. Formations, the mental formations, are like the trunk of a banana tree. 
just rolls of tissue within rolls and rolls of tissue without any hot wood inside. And consciousness is like a magical illusion. It appears but has no substance. So no matter how much we examine them, they just reveal themselves to be empty, shallow forms without any core or any substance, leading processes. They delude us into grasping and attachment. In the end, they prove disappointing. Now one problem that's sometimes raised is how the teaching of non-self fits together with the teaching of rebirth. If no self could be found within the body-mind complex, how can rebirth take place? We'll deal with this question more fully in the later talk, the one on karma and rebirth. Here we'll just give a brief answer. The positing of a self isn't needed to guarantee rebirth. In Buddhism, rebirth is understood as occurring through causal continuity. The body-mind process even in this life, maintains its unity entirely through causal succession without any lasting self. Each moment of experience is connected with its predecessors and with its successors through a transmission of influence, through a causal succession. So each moment of consciousness receives all the stored-up experience that occurred previously in the continuum, the whole storage of memories, habits, tendencies, and karma built up in the past. Then each moment in turn transmits the storage to its successes along with its own unique contribution. And thus the whole stream of experience has a unity and coherence. In one life, we can identify ourselves as the same person from birth to death. But this can be done not because there's a permanent ego entity, but because there is a causal continuity, a transmission of experience going on at every moment. In the same way, at death, the body falls away and memory is blotted out. But the mental process, the stream of consciousness, continues on with the support of a new physical body. Character, experience, dependencies, karma, these pass on through the flow of mind from one life to another. And now we come to the last topic, a very important topic. And this is the place of the teaching on the three characteristics in the Buddha's path to liberation. For the Buddha teaches only dukkha and the way to the end of dukkha. So all of his teachings in some way fit into his path to liberation. Now the Buddha holds that the way to deliverance, the way to the end of dukkha, lies through understanding, through understanding the real nature of our existence. We remain tied to dukkha, to the round of becoming, to suffering, because of our craving, our clinging and attachment. The clinging and attachments continue to operate because our minds are covered over by ignorance and deluded by false conceptions, by the perversion. We cling to the body and mind because we see them as permanent, pleasurable, and as self. We interpret them as mine, but I truly am myself. From these erroneous notions, all sorts of defilements arise. Greed arises as the drive to acquisition. We want to grab hold of more pleasure, more power, higher status. We want to expand the territory of our supposed self, to appropriate things and make them mine. We want to go on becoming in the future, to preserve our individuality, to become immortal. This I deluded idea of self also gives birth to anger and hatred towards what opposes our self. It causes the arising of selfishness, 
jealousy, pride, vanity, competitiveness, the lust for power, and so forth, all arise out of the notion of selfhood. At the deepest level, the ideas of permanence, pleasure, and selfhood sustain the round of samsara. The wheel of birth and death turns because of our ignorance because our minds are attracted by the lore of some kind of lasting happiness to be found within the world, or by the quest to find some identity for our self-concept. We run from one experience to another, from one life to another, seeking pleasure, seeking security, seeking confirmation of our sense of selfhood. But this is somewhat like a donkey hitched to a cart chasing a carrot the driver has dangling in front of him. The donkey pursues the carrot with all of its might, but no matter how fast it runs, it never gets any closer to the carrot, but still it goes on and on, pulling the cart forward. Finally, when the donkey gets tired of chasing the carrot, it stops running. It sits down and relaxes. In the same way, when we get tired of running in pursuit of the objects of our desire or of trying to substantiate our sense of selfhood, then we turn away and go to seek the way to liberation. In that way to liberation, the Buddha points out, lies precisely in the realization of the three marks of existence, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. By turning the focus of our mental eye inward upon our own experience and looking at our experience with insight, we learn to see these three marks stamped on all the phenomena of body and mind, on all the five aggregates. And this leads to an end of identification we stop identifying ourselves with the five aggregates. We see them as not mine, not I, not self. Whatever form and consciousness, that, whatever form there might be, whatever feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness there might be, we stop identifying with them. Then, by realizing the selflessness of all these phenomena, we turn away from them, we become detached, and with detachment there comes liberation. This is what the Buddha says in his second discourse on the mark of not-self. He says that the meditator, the monk, sees the five aggregates, form, feelings, perceptions, the mental formations, and consciousness as impermanent, subject to suffering, and is not self. And when he sees them thus, then he becomes disenchanted with them. He turns away from them. When he turns away from them, he becomes dispassionate towards them. And when he becomes dispassionate towards them, then he becomes liberated from them. And when he is liberated, there arises the knowledge of liberation. He knows destroyed is the round of rebirth. The holy life has been lived. Whatever had to be done has been done, and there is no further becoming to be undergone. That is the end of Dukkha, the goal of the teaching.